So here we are at the Mon Vernon cast iron furnace. This is an old stone cut cast iron furnace from the 1800s. What we're looking at on the right is the, uh, the water wheel that would have diverted the stream, it would have diverted the water from this stream and made a trough at the top. That water wheel would have driven um, a bellows, which would be the hole in the center. That would have blown air. That's why this is called a cold blast uh, cast iron furnace. So on the left is, uh, they're calling it the casting shed, but that's where the, uh, we, we're gonna better picture that, but that's where the cast iron, the molten cast iron would come out and they would make uh, ingots or pigs. They would also make cast iron skillets. They would make stoves and things like that. But basically this would come out as a bloom and we'll take a look at those blooms um, later as well. And those blooms would be sent for processing into wrought iron in uh, Pittsburgh. So this is a shot of a typical cast iron furnace. This furnace would have been 40 foot tall probably 25 by 25 foot wide and deep and I'm not sure the uh, diameter of the Bosch which is what the chimney would be that's where the metal would have been melted so this is a, a very very good representation of uh, any of the cast iron furnaces you'd find in uh, Pennsylvania so this is a diorama of what the cast iron furnace would look like up on top we have the charging platform that's where the the cast iron the, the ore iron ore would come up with the charcoal and the limestone this would be where they would actually pour everything into, into the hole. Um, down here is the water going on the water wheel. That water wheel would move the bellows up and down. You can see the bellows inside. The bellows would actually be blowing air into one of the openings that we're going to see in the furnace. And that's what would, uh, that oxygen would create a very high heat and that would melt the cast iron. So it's a very good representation. You don't really get to see this anywhere. It's, uh, it's a very nice job what they have done. So the water wheel that we're looking at here in this picture is the same setup as the water wheel that's in front of the furnace. So the Historical Society has done a nice job um, probably six or seven or maybe ten years ago when they looked at this furnace it was in real disrepair. But uh, these guys have done a very, very good job of putting this furnace back in, um, in pristine condition from the furnaces that I've seen. And the interesting things here are the dates. 1798 is when this was built. Um, after a certain number of years, the, the brick that lines this has to be replaced, so they say this was rebuilt. Blown out in 1830, which means they quit using it in 1830, and uh, it employs about 60 men. You really couldn't see that, but there's just a lot of things going on in the background. There's guys cutting trees down to make the charcoal. There's uh, blacksmiths. There's guys that are molders. There's uh, the, the cast iron expert himself, the iron master, who would have lived around here in one of these houses. You don't really see any of the houses now. All that's gone. But this is the, uh, at least this is a nice plaque to commemorate. So here we are in the front of the furnace. Again, this is the wheel. The water would come from the top of the wheel. There would have been a shaft coming out right through here. And there would be two bellows, which would be two levers that operate the bellows, which would be the air going into the bottom. You can see, uh, we get a little closer here. The air comes in through here. You can see that hole. And just that little hole, maybe a seven inch diameter, would be enough to get this up to maybe 1800, 2000 degrees Fahrenheit, which would be enough to melt the cast iron and the limestone. So one thing to be careful of when you're looking at these furnaces, we happen to see this, which is an old snakeskin. And I just kind of picked that up. I'm not sure if that's a uh, rattlesnake or a non-poisonous snake, but we don't like to take chances. So anytime you see these bricks, you know, you see a lot of holes and things. You make, want to make sure just from a safety standpoint that you don't stick your fingers in there. You're always, always being situationally aware of your surroundings. So here's the business part of the furnace. You have everything going on. You have the charcoal, you have the cast iron, you have the, 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 the ingots are coming out. Once it gets hot enough, this is all blocked off now, but you can see these pots. These pots are crucibles and that little circle thing is what would hold the crucible so that when the cast iron is pouring out of that, and we're talking 30 tons of, of molten metal, 1800 degrees Fahrenheit coming out. These guys would be standing there. They don't have the protective gear we have now, but they would be filling these ladles up with the molten metal. And then they would come walking back over here and they would pour them into uh, sand castings of furnaces uh, or cast iron skillets or any of the, any of the wares that they would be, uh, be using. What we see here is a trough. This, this trough was actually what they uh, named the ingots for. We, I call them ingots, but what they called them back then were pigs because this looked like um, the, the piglets suckling on the mother pig. But the cast iron would come out, molten cast iron. 
it would fill up each one of these and after it cooled they would break them off they would put them on a trailer and they would ship them into Pittsburgh or someplace for processing so again this is cast iron it's very high in carbon and you really can't use it for any type of um, anything without changing it into wrought iron and here's some of the byproduct this is some of the slag that is left over so it's probably not not very usable so the, the first thing that would come out would be this slag and after the slag you would actually get the cast iron so again this is just kind of sitting here to show people uh, what, what the byproduct of it is. So on the top of the furnace is where the smoke everything comes out that's also this would have been the, the charging platform so there would have been a a bridge work starting on the hillside where there would have, would have been a ramp where the men would have brought the charcoal the, the, the uh, wrought iron not the wrought iron but the, the cast iron and the iron ore and the limestone and dumped it into here layer after layer after layer and, and, and it, this would have just been flames and smoke and night. You'd have been able to see it for miles and miles around. And uh, that, that's basically how they got the, the metal into it. And again, down at the bottom was where the metal was. So now we focus out. from the, the furnace, the, the landscape, to a couple of items that were here. Not exactly sure what this keystone, the WPA, but it's uh, 1936. I think that's a nice piece. But this is the more interesting one, which is. Uh, not so much a headstone as it is a plaque. Looks like it says number seven with the director's names and whether those were the people that were actually working on this. Um, 1877, that's about the time this thing was in operation. So not exactly what these are. There's a bunch of names here. It does say built AD 1877, so it's probably a placard commemorating this furnace. All right, so now again, we're on the side of the furnace. You, you look at the top, there's really nothing up there. But what was back, what you would have seen back here in the 1870s, early 1800s, would have been a, a ramp, wooden ramp, uh, going to the side. And the, the men would come with their carts, and they would bring the um, old cast iron that, that, that didn't go so well, that, that they broke up, the, the iron ore, the limestone, and the charcoal would all been dumped on top. They would have just poured it in like you'd empty a wheelbarrow. And that's pretty much what they did, is emptied a wheelbarrow in here. And as... Uh, Basically, the flames would just keep going up and they'd put layers of uh, cast iron, iron ore, the charcoal, and the limestone, layer after layer after layer. And the bellows would, would heat it up and then they would pour once the thing was done. And uh, it would probably take 20 hours to heat everything up a full day. This ran 24 hours a day, seven days a week. A lot of times it ran in the winter time. And uh, I mean, these, these guys lived a tough life. Actually, here we are at the back of the furnace. Again, if, if you were back here, a hundred and some years ago, you see the stream, what's the, the remnants of the stream on the other side of these uh, four by fours, but you would actually, they would have diverted the water and you can see some water coming out up here behind this tree. You can see some water. They would have diverted that water into a wooden uh, trough system. The trough system would come all the way over here to the top of this water wheel and it would deposit the water. The wheel would have spun this way and again that would have blown the bellows. So on the far left we have one outbuilding and then we have a, uh, a historical center. I'm not exactly sure what's in it. There's no signs posted but there's some pamphlets and again that's where the, uh, the diorama is sitting there. So again these guys have done a very nice job preserving this uh, furnace. If you ever get a chance you're in Bullskin area south of uh, Mount Pleasant. Please take a look. Thank you.